It's been wonderful. It's been rich. We have CDs. If if um, you're wanting to get copies of sessions you've not been to or you just want to take it and listen to it again, it's also online on our website, on YouTube, and, and whatever. Um, so you're able to get it in many different ways. But let's put our hands together. We love you, Pastor Gary. We are... We, we really love you. The church loves you. And we are requesting him back next year. Amen. Hallelujah. Put your hands together as he comes forward. Well, praise the Lord. This is my last session. So we're going to do about five in one right here. No, we're just going to do as much as we can, right? We got an hour. We should get a lot done, right? With God's help. Amen. Father, we just commit this time to you. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just come and be our teacher, just like Jesus promised that you would be. Father, in Jesus' name, anything that would distract us or keep us from hearing exactly what you would have us to hear and doing what you would have us to do, bound in Jesus' name. The freedom for Holy Spirit to move in this place, God. And we give you praise and glory for that. Let's just pray in the Spirit just for a minute. We love you, Lord. We just praise you, Lord. We glorify you, Jesus. You're good, God. You are good. We glorify your name, Lord. We glorify your name, Lord. We exalt you, Father. Praise be to you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Mighty God, mighty God, mighty God. Jehovah, you are God. We glorify your name. We glorify your name. We glorify your name. Lord, I just pray you refill every person in here with your spirit. Just continue to pour your spirit out on them, Lord, at whatever level they're at and whatever they need, God. We pray you just meet them right there. We ask you, Lord, to meet us right now. Meet us right now, Lord, right where you are. Hey, thank you, Lord. Lord, as we move toward you, we thank you that you move toward us, that you meet us on the road. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We give you glory in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Say amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. All right, you going to help me preach a little bit this morning? Oh, we're in trouble then because I'm going to try to teach instead of preach, so... But we're going to see what happens. We're going, we're going to go ahead and jump right into 1 Corinthians uh, 12. I think that's where, you know what? I think I wrote the wrong scripture down. No, 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2 and John 14. So you can kind of dog ear both of those places in your Bible. Hopefully you got your, the word of the Lord with you this morning. How many of you enjoyed last night? Praise the Lord. You feel like you got a spiritual impartation? Something happened? Obviously for you. Obviously for a lot of us. If you weren't here last night, I think Pastor's right. Get the, uh, however you, whatever media, CD, MP3, whatever, however. Yeah, just try to get it. And, and, uh, and even if you were here, it's probably a good thing to go back over things. We, we were talking last night about spiritual gifts. And I can't remember, did anybody title that thing? Did I title it? I don't think I did. Bill, come on. You got one job. Yeah. Six steps. So that was, that was the night before. That was. That's right. There were ten. Okay, you're fired, Bill. Sorry. <laughs> he named my first sermon really well. I mean, it was like, that's an awesome title. Way to go. Ten points regarding spiritual gifts. Okay, you get to move up one row. You can move forward one row. Be careful. You'll lose your seat. You should have had that one. You got your notepad out. Thank you. Very good, Bill. He, okay, you're reinstated. You lost your pension, though. Sorry. 
<laughs> okay, 1 Corinthians, you're going to be in 2, but I'm going to read chapter 12 just to kind of refresh where we were uh, yesterday, last night, talking about spiritual gifts. Now, we started off talking about faith, and uh, there was a prophetic word. These two young ladies had prophetic words last night, and it totally re, it just flipped my world upside down. And I got completely off faith, and I don't think I'm going to go back there uh, because just, it's just in my heart this morning. When I, when I got up early and was praying this morning, I slept really good last night, so watch out today. Um, I, just, I just felt like the Lord said, you know, because I was just thanking. You know, the first thing I do is begin thanking God. You know, thank you, Lord, that so many of your people got touched last night. So I thought about you. Thank you, Lord, that she got touched last night. So many of you, I, I was just, you know, like, Lord, thank you that you've energized them in their, in their spiritual gifts. And they received an impartation that they, just like Paul said, you know, the, the flames of God have been fanned inside of them. And if you weren't, if you weren't here last night, we, so we have to eat right at noon, right? So I'll stop early enough that if you weren't here and you didn't get prayer, we, can we do that today? Okay, sorry to put you on the spot like that. I should have asked you beforehand. It's really hard when a guest minister says, hey, can I, you know, can I go on five more minutes? I mean, what are you going to say? No. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, no, stop. <laughs> do you mind if I do this? Yes. I mean, nobody says that, right? So it puts you on the spot. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. So we'll just stop. Um, okay, Ben, you're the keeper of the clock, so don't let me go past noon. So we'll stop. Five minutes, ten minutes till. So if you didn't get prayer last night, before I leave, I want to pray for you. And I ask God that you would receive an impartation. And I believe that every impartation you've ever received, you are able to impart that into others. Look, that's a scriptural principle. The, our Old Testament patriarchs, they laid hands on their children and they blessed them. They, did, they didn't just bless them right before they died. They blessed them throughout their entire life. They blessed them whenever the men became, whenever the boys became men. They blessed them. They blessed them at their, at their weddings. They gathered together in that hoopah, and they, they laid hands on them, and they blessed them. That's one of my favorite things about the, about the weddings that we do at, at home, at church, is we lay hands on them and bless them. So I want to lay hands on you and bless you. I want to bless you like the people who, who came before me blessed me. The, the people that my spiritual fathers uh, in the Lord, and don't get weird with that terminology. That gets really weird sometimes. It's not. It shouldn't be. Jesus is our heavenly. God is our heavenly father. You know, so, so uh, but I want to do that. I want to ask the Lord to give you what, anything that he has given me, I want him to multiply it in your life. And I want to see it multiplied in the people that, you, you know, like we said yesterday, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the things that you have seen me, see, seen me do and heard me preach, that you would commit those things to faithful men and women who will be able to teach others also. So when you receive this impartation, it's not just for you. It's so you can go and impart that into others. You can believe I have received this, whether you feel it or not. You can lay hands on people and believe that, right? So I was praying about spiritual gifts this morning, and I was just thanking the Lord for that. And, and the Lord really impressed upon my heart. He said, look, they're not going to understand the gifts if they don't know the giver. And I just got it, such a check in my spirit because I'm, I'm a Holy Spirit guy. I love Holy Spirit. He's my absolute best friend. And like we were talking, uh, is. Yeah, but can I call you Daniel? What's your official name? Daniel. Okay, I like Daniel. I like Daniel. Whoo! Don't be surprised if God doesn't change your name. Don't be surprised if people don't start calling you Daniel. Because Daniel means righteous judge. It means one who stands in right standing with God. And because of that right standing, he's able to see what is right and what is wrong and make judgment calls in his heart as to the way he should walk. Daniel. We were talking about that. That was a prophetic moment in case you don't know what prophetic ministry is. Anytime I cry like that, it's prophetic. That's one of my indicators. You have them too. You have them too. You need to develop those things. Like, I, I govern the prophetic area at our church. And, like, when you ladies 
prophesied I immediately before you even started speaking I, I teared up I knew that's an indicator for me so we were talking the other day about getting baptized in the Holy Spirit how it changed my life and how it changed your life and it, the ability that it gave me to to really stay away from sin and to say no to sin look we're going to sin you know don't but you're not an old wretched sinner you are a wretch you were a wretched sinner saved by grace but you have the ability not to sin when you allow holy spirit to govern and control your life so our our society our world right now is just in turmoil it's in, it's in just craziness everywhere we look politicians legislators uh, school teachers everybody's trying to fix whatever this craziness is and it's like they're putting a band-aid on this giant gash of a wound that it, it can only and the only reason it's there is because society and our world has lost its internal regulator and that internal regulator is Holy Spirit once again another car illustration if I may like your car has an alternator or a generator on it that causes it to charge the battery inside of that unit there is a thing called the regulator in old vehicles in your school buses bill there's a governor that governor causes you not to be able to blow up the motor what it does is when it gets to a certain rpm it kicks it back so it protects the engine the regulator protects the electrical system holy spirit is your internal regulator it's your governor it's what helps you to hold back when adam sinned we lost that internal regulator we lost that governor and now mankind is running rampantly crazy and it doesn't matter what the politicians do it doesn't matter what the society does it doesn't matter what the medical people do nothing will replace that governor other than holy spirit and one of the main reasons jesus came and died was not just to forgive you of your sins it was to reinstall what was lost in the garden and that was holy spirit Holy Spirit, that thing that controlled and governed Adam and Eve was lost when sin came in. So when Jesus came and died on the cross for your sin, immediately at that point upon acknowledging that, confessing that, and accepting that, Holy Spirit comes inside of you. He is what regulates you. But just having him on the inside is not good enough. You've got to have him on the outside too. So when the Lord spoke to me this morning and said, just, knowing, just having the gift is not good enough, they have to understand the giver. So I feel like today I want to just expound for what time we have just on who that giver is and what he's meant to me and how it works in my life. So going back to the gifts, I'm going to go through this really fast. I'm going to talk pretty fast. Remember, I gave you two scriptures, 1 Corinthians 2 and John 14, so you can kind of look at those. Uh, Paul said this, 1 Corinthians 12, 1, Brethren, now concerning spiritual gifts, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be uninformed. He jumped down to verse 7. He says, don't, don't look at this one. Don't, don't get over there. You'll get distracted. I see you turning your pages. <laughs> but the, manifest, the manifestation of the Spirit... Is given to each one to the profit of all. For one is given, I'm just going to run through the, the, these spiritual gifts. There's nine of them. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healings, working of miracles, spirits of discernment, tongues, different kind of tongues, interpretation. And then he says, the same spirit works all these, distributing to each one as he wills. So God is still giving these supernatural gifts today, and you received those last night. You opened yourself up for them, and you came, and I believe God put those in you. All right, some of you have always operated in discernment of spirits. and many places you've been in fellowship, people have exiled you. Maybe even your family has said, oh, she's critical, or oh, he's judgmental. No, you're discerning right and sometimes prophetic people get labeled with oh you're bossy you know miss bossy pants or whatever you know well prophetic people are like that that's what the prophet does he's the pointer he's the one who, who lines out the church but he has to work in conjunction with the apostle who is the one separated apart and then if those two guys aren't working along with an evangelist which is the tallest of that's the one that's closest to god the one highest all on the 
on the chart. He's reaching close to God because God's heart is always souls. And then working in conjunction with the, with the pastor, which is the ring finger. He's married to the church. And the teacher who gets in your ear, and that's what I'm trying to do tonight, today, is get in your ear to teach you, to show you. So all of those work together to make a, com a complete fist. The gifts of the Spirit are very much the exact same way. The fruit of the Spirit is very much the same way. They all need to work in conjunction and work together as a whole. So there are three gifts that are called dynamic gifts. I call them the do gifts. Faith, miracles, and healings. Those are the do gifts. Those are the things that have action. There's three gifts that are called declarative gifts. I call that the say gifts. So we got do gifts, which are faith, miracles, and healings. And then we got the say gifts, which are prophecies, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Okay, so that's six of the nine. The last three are discernment gifts. I call these the no gifts. So look, this is extreme. Look, the dynamic and the declarative gifts the, the, so this is in, important to know. The do gifts and the, the say gifts are going to be the ones used the most in our generation to deceive the church. You better get this. These are the ones that are going to be used the most to deceive the church. If you don't believe this, look, you need to read Thessalonians. You need to read Matthew 24. You need to read what Peter said about it. You need to read these books and understand that in the last times, many will depart from the faith. They will, they will run to teachers and preachers with itching ears, wanting their ears to be scratched with the wrong kind of doctrine. I'm telling you, it's happening right now. We have major denominations that are completely turning away from the Word of God when it relates to sexual purity and immorality. And alcohol, our city at home has Bible study beer meetings in pubs. You know, we just, I'm not saying you can't drink. I am saying this. The Bible says there are things that thou shalt not do and there are things that thou should not do. And it definitely says thou should not drink. And if you don't understand that, you need to get the word and you need to understand there's three different words in the Bible for wine. One of them is strong drink, which is liquor. One of them is fermented wine, which has alcohol. And one of them is the fruit of the vine that Jesus said, I will not touch this fruit of the vine, this type of wine, again, till I return. Jesus never drank wine. When he turned the, the water into wine, it wasn't, look at the word. Just do me a favor. Look at the word. Look at his first miracle. Research the word. Get your strongs out and see if that word has alcohol in it or not. It does not. Good wine in Bible days was wine that the grapes were skinned completely. Yeast is on the outside of the grape. That's what the white stuff is on the grape. They skinned that completely, and then they squeezed it so good wine had no yeast in it. If yeast or peels got in the wine, after a few months it fermented, and then it turned to alcohol. That was considered bad wine. So at the wedding, is this okay? I don't want to mess with your doctor, and if you're drinking church, have fun. But I don't. I don't, I, don't think, I, don't think Jesus, I don't think Jesus ever touched alcohol because he was a high priest, and he wasn't allowed to touch yeast. Right? So anyway... When, in, in the wedding, that's what the guy said. He said, wow, everybody saves the, you know, the, the bad wine for last, but you've brought out the best wine at the last. The best wine was wine which was concentrated sweetened juice that they diluted with water, which is exactly the same word that Paul told Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach's sake because the water in that region was very acidic and it was causing him stomach problems. So, so Timothy because he was righteous and wanted to avoid even the appearance of evil, wouldn't even drink wine that had no alcohol in it because he didn't want somebody to see him and think he was drinking alcohol. So how much more should we abstain from anything with the appearance of evil? How did I get off on that? Anyway, that's what's wrong with our world. That's how we get deceived. That's how we get deceived. Well, the Bible says you're not supposed to drink. It just says don't get drunk. That's true. It does say that. It doesn't say you can't drink. It says don't get drunk. It very clearly says don't get drunk, which is an excess, which is debauchery, right? Look, I'm no virgin here. I used to drink all the time. I mean, I smoke more dope than you can put in this building. I'm serious. I, I didn't just fall in the pit. I backstroked in the pit. I enjoyed the pit. I mean, it, was, it was great. 
But the end is death. You know, the, the end is death. And if you say you're drinking wine just to relax or you're drinking a beer with your pizza because it tastes good, you are lying. You're lying. You're drinking to get a buzz. You're drinking to get a buzz. And, and you should be praying in tongues to relax. You should be drawing on Holy Spirit, not some other spirits. Why do you think they used to call them spirits? Right? Over the, over the bars, it used to say spirits. Eats and spirits. Boy, that's a fact, isn't it? It'll open you up to all kinds of perversion. What you normally could say no, no to, like you men, you could normally say no to a premarital or extramarital affair. When you get a few beers in you, it's a whole lot easier to say yes. Because that spirit, you just yielded Holy Spirit's control to another spirit. Same thing when you gossip. Now we're meddling. Same thing when you gossip. Same things when you murder, murmur. Galatians 5 has a really cool scripture in it that all of us charismatic Pentecostal type people love. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's just awesome. We totally forget the nine things that come before that. Or no, there's 18 of them. They're called the works of the flesh. Right along beside of murder is gossiping and a party spirit and debauchery and lasciviousness. Anyway, it's good to study those things out. So these gifts, these prophetic gifts, these declarative gifts, these dynamic gifts, it's what the enemy is going to use in the end times to deceive the church. So it is so important that we have the discerning gifts operating in the church. We have to, like, like when you, now I'm, I realize I'm not in control of this meeting at all. She passed me the baton. I'm going to give it right back to her. This is her deal. But when you ladies prophesied inside of me, being in the office that I am, immediately I begin judging. Look, don't, you know, the, the, you know, any alcoholic anywhere who doesn't know anything about God, the very first scripture they're going to quote you is, judge not lest you be judged. I'm not talking about that kind of judgment. I'm talking about what the Bible says, that the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. So when you prophesied... I, did, I began to go into a mode, which is biblical, that said, is she prophesying out of Holy Spirit or her spirit? That's what that scripture means. Is, is, she prophe is that a Holy Spirit word or is that her spirit's word? Right? So I could, I could prophesy maybe because maybe I know you a little bit. I, I don't very well at all. I mean, I, I recognize your face. But... Are you married? Okay, so I could prophesy out of my spirit. Well, the Lord would say he's got the right man for you. Because my spirit would like to see her with the right man. Okay, so the, the prophets should say at that point, that's not the right spirit. That's why so many people have false prophecies spoken over their lives. Because your spirit gets all tangled up with Holy Spirit. So we have to have the discernment of spirits to keep us out of deception. Because we can fall prey to a, to a prophetic word that is a pathetic word. It's not it, because it was given out of the wrong spirit. And sometimes it's even given out of the wrong spirit for the right reason. You know, because it's love. Oh, I just love you. I just want to see you blessed. You know, I, I know you want to be fulfilled as a wife, and I know you need a family. And I just want to, you know, Lord, the Lord just says, wait, for your man is, your redemption draweth nigh, or whatever. We can throw all kinds of color on it. But the bottom line is, if Holy Spirit didn't say it, it's the wrong spirit. Amen. Is this okay? Yes. Okay, so, and remember, whatever gift you may have received or whatever gift you may be operating in, you can be 100% right in your gift and be 100% wrong in your delivery. So your delivery can determine whether your gift is used correctly or not. Believe me, I know that. I'm the guy who replays all of my tape, all of my preaching sermons in my head. Like I lay down at night and like, oh my God, did I really say that? I can't believe I told you that the preacher looked at my grandma's rear end the other day. But I did. I said it. It flew right out of my mouth. 
you know, so, so you, you, you see what I'm saying? Oh, my Lord, I said it twice. Okay, Second Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, we need, to, we need to move on. That was another one of those longest. This is what Paul said, 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, I'm sorry, verse 1. And I'm going to read out of the New King James this morning. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit, big S, and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul said in the, in the NIV version, it says this, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Look, it's vitally important that we understand that our life, we, we need to know that our life be accompanied with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. There's, would anybody buy a television before looking at the picture? I wouldn't. Would, would anybody drop, buy a car, a $20,000 car, even a $5,000 car or a $1,000 car without starting it up, listening to the motor and driving it around the block? Look, the world wants a demonstration of the power. For too long, the church has been trying to sell something that they won't let the world test drive. Well, it's here, but, you know, you got to get holy first. You know, change your hairstyle, change everything about you, start being like us, and then maybe you'll get to operate in the power. That's not going to sell, and it hasn't worked. The world is hungry to see the power of God demonstrated. And I, I, that's, this is when I was filled with Holy Spirit, Daniel, this is what I said. I want to do that. I want to demonstrate the power. I want to pray for people and see them get healed before they're saved. Just like Jesus did. I want to feed the multitudes while they're heathens. And them have me come, come to me and say, how do I do that? What must I do to be saved? So, do you have a Sam's Club around here? One of the coolest things about Sam's Club is the ladies with the little samples. The sample lady. It, aren't they awesome? You know, the toothpicks and the, the weenies or whatever. Any, it doesn't matter. Egg rolls. They have everything. So you walk down the aisles and there's all this frozen food and you look at the picture and you open it up and you hold the box and it's cold and you think, eh. But that lady with that tray, oh my gosh, she sells some frozen stuff, doesn't she? Right? That's exactly what the world wants. They want a sample of the entree. They're not going to buy something frozen and cold and hard. We need to be more like the Sam's Club lady. <laughs> uh, point is with what Paul's saying right here is we can't allow, we can't allow the faith of those that we lead to Christ to rest on our delivery or our words or anything about us. It's got to be, I mean, you know, I've been, I've sit in a lot of preaching and I've watched a lot of pre preachers and I've studied a lot of preachers and a lot of times I've left meetings thinking, I am so dumb, you know, and really I, I preach at places before and think there's, I, every time I preach at White Horse, I'm like, there's a there's 500 preachers in here that's better preachers than me. Not to mention the ones that are on staff. What am I doing up here? You know, you know Larry the Cable Guy, Duck Dynasty is like, why would anybody even want to listen? But, you know, honestly, that's what Paul was saying. It's not in my words. It's not in my delivery. It's not in my excellency of speech. It's in the demonstration of the power of Holy Spirit. So when you see somebody like me be able to give an altar call or lay hands on somebody and see them get healed, then you know, dear Lord, if Pastor Gary can do it, anybody can do it. There's hope for me, right? Hopefully, I think that's what God's made me, kind of the poster boy for hope for the nation, right? Okay, John 14, I told you to go there, right? Did you make it there yet? Did I not tell you to go to John 14? I don't know either. <laughs> John 14, praise the Lord. 
I know I've messed with you guys a lot this week, and you're not used to the way I do things, but this is what I decided when I moved to Indiana. I'm not going to change for those people. They make fun of the way I talk because I say why and I say windows and things like that and tire, you know, but then I, li I don't listen to the radio much, but I heard some country music and people want to talk like me. So the heck with you, Indiana people, you know, I'm just going to be myself. I'm going to be who God created me to be. I'm going to be the best me because you know what? If I try to be Jeff Johns, who's going to be Gary Osborne? Hello. We spend way too much time trying to be somebody else. Just be you. Just be you. He created you specifically, sister. He wired you up for a purpose. He downloaded software in you that only you have. You'll touch people I'll never touch. You'll speak to people I'll never speak to. You'll, every one of you is as individual as your fingerprint. Every one of you have a, has a, not only do you have specific DNA, you have a specific call. None of them are the same. None of them are the same. So be you. Be you. Stop being marked by some, what somebody said about you or didn't say about you. Don't get your affirmation from man. Get it from God. And it comes directly from Holy Spirit. I got to get to what Holy Spirit does. Oh, my. Time flies in this place. It's amazing. John 14, 6. Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for through me. Verse 7, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father. And, it, and that will be sufficient for us. And Jesus, knowing that that wouldn't be sufficient, Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, yet you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father? Look at this. We need to really stop for a minute. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father and I, I'm sorry, I am in the Father and the, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Now, look, he shifted gears. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. He's talking about words. Look at this. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Words and works are tied together. We talked about this a little bit when we talked about faith. Verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to my Father. Look, it's Jesus' desire that every one of us as believers, do greater works than he did. Not only is his, it's his desire, he made a provision for it. We have that. We see it happening in, in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5, uh, Mark 16. He gives us, you know, these signs will follow those that will believe. They will cast out demons. They'll speak with other tongues. They'll take up serpents, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. These greater works that he's talking about aren't just greater in number, which I've heard people preach that, these greater works are also greater in scope. We can reach people in a way Jesus was never able to right now. You can put one dumb picture of sushi on Facebook and reach 10,000 people like that. Right? It took months for Jesus to get that kind of following. Look at verse 12 again. And, and then we're going to have to move on. I don't want to get parked on this. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me and the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these will he do because I go to my Father. Verse 13. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now say this with me. In my name. That's what Jesus said. In my name. So we, we talked about faith just a little bit. Did you win today? 
You haven't played yet? Well, this is a good way to get charged up and ready to win. We talked a little bit about praying in Jesus' name, and we did that a little bit when we were talking about faith, but I want to just kind of come back on this and hit this a minute just so we don't get in error here. When you pray in Jesus' name or when you cast out a demon in the name of Jesus and you use the name of Jesus, now some people get really hung up on this because they, like I have a tendency sometimes to say, I cast you out in Jesus' name. And a lot of people don't like that. You've got to be careful where you put the emphasis the emphasis always goes on G in Jesus' name, not on I. I can't do anything. All I can do is be the container for what Jesus is and what Jesus does. I'm just the conduit. I'm just the pipe. I'm the Dixie cup. I'm, I'm what holds the grape juice, right? So, um, so when you start talking about in the name of Jesus, so praying, so when you, anything that you do in the name of Jesus, so in other words, praying you are praying or saying anything that's in harmony with his person and Jesus' person, Jesus' character, and Jesus' will. All right, so in order for this in the name of Jesus prayer to be effective in your life, it has to be in harmony with his person. It has to be in harmony with his character. It has to be in harmony with his will. So praying, so praying uh, with faith in him and his authority so I'm, I'm, when I use his name, I'm using his authority with the desire to both glorify God and the Father. So praying in the name of Jesus means that God will honor any prayer that Jesus would have prayed. So when you say, in the name of Jesus, come out, you have to know that God would honor, if Jesus said that, God would honor it. Now some things we use in the name of Jesus for, God wouldn't honor so the name of Jesus has no effect there. That's why a lot of times people come to, come to me and say, Pastor, I prayed and I said in the name of Jesus, but it didn't work. Well, the name of Jesus works. What, what didn't work was you were trying to pray something that was not in harmony with the character of Jesus. You follow me? Jesus walked by the, the man at the gate beautiful. He walked by him. Peter walked by him when the man was ready and healed him. So see, there's, there's, there's the character, the will, and that purpose, right? If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray. We're in verse 15 now. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father. Man, that's awesome. Think about that. Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, that I'm going to pray the Father, and he's going to send, look, Jesus will pray that the Father will give the comforter only the, to those who are serious about him and serious about their love for him. Notice in that, in that right there, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Notice he's using the present tense right there, if you love me. He didn't say, if you have loved me. Too often, we are trying to ride on the coattails of what we had done in the past, not what we're doing right now. He said, if you love me right now. Not if you loved me when you got saved. Not if you loved me three or four years ago. If you loved me while you were on a mission trip. If you loved me in the middle of worship. He said, if you love me, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, comforter, that he may abide with you for you forever. Now, can we, can we take like five minutes and just talk about Holy Spirit? Just break down the Holy Spirit? Okay. He, this is what he says. Look at this again. Verse 16, you are in the right verse. Did, did I, I didn't skip chapters on you, did I? And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper or another comforter. Say another. another. All right, so look, we need to break this down just for a minute. So, so that word, comforter, is the Greek word parakletos, and that means someone who will come alongside, one called to come alongside. So look. Holy Spirit doesn't have an option here. He was sent. He was called to come alongside. So he has to be with you. If you're born again and he's inside of you, even if you take him into a bar, he may not like it. He may not be able to operate in there at all. You may be in sin and he may be, have his hands tied, but he is called to be alongside of you. You may, keeping, you may be keeping him from being able to do anything, but he's called. See? 
he, he said, I will pray the Father, and he will send you another comforter. And look, that word comforter means ally, strengthener, counselor, helper, advocate, friend, advisor. It means all of those things. He's our advisor. Holy Spirit's your advisor. He's your problem solver. He's, look, I, honestly, I don't even, I don't even try to find a place to park at Walmart. With, well, honestly, if you don't pray to find a place to park at Walmart, something's wrong with you. But I, I, I ask Holy Spirit about everything. Do you realize where you park may have something to do with someone's eternal future? Just you getting out of the car and bumping into them or helping them with a bag of groceries could leave the door open so you could share Christ with them? How, why do we belittle such things? Holy Spirit's with you. He's your ally. He's your comforter. He's your paraclete. I like that word, paraclete. It reminds me of parakeet. Like he sits right on your shoulder. He's right on your shoulder saying, eh, don't do that. Or, yeah, go for it. Right? He's right there, whispering in your ear. All we got to do is keep our ears open to what he's saying and quit looking through these natural eyes. That's why one of the first things we prayed about in this conference was, Lord, give them eyes to see, ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. That's why sometimes we see and hear so much in worship. It's because we set aside that time. We push away everything. That's why we get prophetic words in worship and maybe don't get them in the line at Walmart. He wants to talk to us all the time. He's our ally. He's called alongside us. He's our strengthener. When you feel like you can't do anything else, he's there to strengthen you. Now, look, here's, I'm, I'm teaching right now, okay? Here's another word, another. He said, I will give you another comforter, another one. Okay, so the Greek word right here in that text for another is the word aleon, A-L-L-O-N. The meaning of that means another of the same kind. So there's, there's two different words here in the Greek for another. This is why it's so important to study your Bible. You just can't read it because we read it with a Western mentality. And look, if you think the Bible changes due to culture, you're wrong. The Bible never changes. So we have to find out what they meant by what they were saying. So he said, there's, so there's two words for another. He said, I will send you another comforter. This word, aleon, means another of the same kind. Now, there's another word called heteros, H-E-T-E-R-O-S, heteros. The, that is another of a different kind. So see, we don't have that in English. We have another, which means another. They had two words, another of the same kind and another of a different kind. So Jesus uses this word. He said, the Father's going to send you another of the same kind. So in other words, let's say Pastor, has, let's say, let's say um, I'm at her house and she's very hospitable. She's a wonderful get, a host. And she said, she says, Pastor, would you like a piece of fruit? And I said, yes, I will take a piece of fruit. And she gives me an apple. And I eat the apple and it's very good. And she comes up and says, would you like another piece of fruit? And then she hands me another apple. That's what Jesus said. Another of the same kind. Now, if she said, Pastor, would you like another piece of fruit? And I said, yes. And she handed me a banana. It's still a piece of fruit, but it's another of a different kind. You see what I'm saying? So Jesus said, when I go away, guys, it's going to be better for you. Because even though... You've seen me raise the dead. You've seen me open blind eyes. You haven't had to pay taxes, pulled it out of a fish's mouth. You've seen thousands fed with a, a fish sandwich and a order of nuggets, right? All of this has happened, but it's going to be better for you when I go away because when I go away, I'm going to send another one of the same kind as me. And this one's not going to be with you, walking alongside you. This one's going to be in you so so it's not going to be you walking with someone doing the miracles it's going to be the one in you of the exact same kind doing the miracles friend that's greater works 
That's as simple as I can put it right there. And you can do it. Anybody can do it. There's not, there's not a big Holy Spirit for adults and a little Holy Spirit for children. I've seen children pray for people. I've seen legs pop out of their sockets with little kids praying for them. Seriously. My mom had a two and a half inch lift on her legs. When she was little, when she was little, her brother pulled a chair out from under her when she sat down and it jammed her back up and messed her back up for her whole life. I was 20 some years old and I had seen hundreds of people. This is when we were hanging out with the hunters a lot. The, oh, you and I talked about the hunters and they would pray for people and people's legs would grow out. Well, we started doing it. I mean, he, you know, look, Charles laid hands on me and said, you can have what I have. I said, okay, I'm going to do it. So we would, we would set people down. You know, we'd hold their legs up, and we'd pray. And uh, at the time, I was, I was pastoring a church and doing construction work. And we would, if we were in my area, we'd stop by mom's house. I mean, man, she made some killer chicken and dumplings. So my, the buddies that I worked with said, hey, let's stop by your mom's house. And we did tent revivals and healing meetings. And so my mom's in there hobbling around with her built-up shoe. She'd had it for 50 years. And the buddy, J.D. Shelton, that I worked with, uh, he said, hey, why don't you, because he was just at the meeting. He was like, hey, why don't you pray for your mom's leg? I'm like, man, are you crazy? I'm, she's my mom. I mean, you know, it's hard to pray for your parents, right? Well, it is in the South. I guess it's different here in Minnesota. But anyway, um, so I'm like, no, man, no way. I'm not, I am not going to do that. He said, well, I'll do it. And so he said, uh, Lib, her name was Elizabeth, Lib, would it be all right if we pray for your leg? And she said, sure. So she sat down and, you know, she still had her nightgown on, you know, just typical bun in the hair. And she's, he picks her legs up and, you know, sure enough, of course, it's, it's, I mean, her shoe was built up that much, two and a half inches. Wore it all her life. And he held her legs up there and he said, all right, I'm just going to pray. And we just, we just started praying. She wasn't even baptized in the Holy Spirit yet. I hadn't let her in the Holy Spirit baptism yet. And it went, I mean, literally, it went, it made that noise. She went, oh, and her leg popped out that far. So she stood up and started walking around, never wore a built-up shoe again for the rest of her life. I saw, we saw the exact same thing happen like a month later with a child no bigger than that little boy right there. Couldn't have been more than five years old. Did the exact same thing. Because, I mean, we had a line of people up there. And he was going along holding their legs up. You know, holding their legs up to look at their ankles to see if they were lined up. And people's legs were popping out like crazy. What, what made me start talking about that? Oh, it's the same, it's the same Holy Spirit. No matter, no matter if it's a little kid, a big kid, it doesn't make any difference. So Jesus told his disciples, you're going to have it better when I go away. Can you imagine what they thought? How could it get any better? How could it get any better? They found out in Acts chapter 2. Okay, so did you get that about another of the same kind? The fruit illustration, was that good? Good. A little encouragement would be nice here. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so in other words, Holy Spirit continues what Christ himself did here on earth. He just does it through you. The same thing is continuing right now. He's doing it through you. So if the gospel's not being multiplied, people aren't getting saved, and people aren't getting delivered, and demons aren't getting cast out, and the dead's not being raised, it's our fault. It's our fault. I'm not going to get anywhere close to being done with this, Pastor. So Jesus promised, he said, I'm going to send another comforter of the same kind, Holy Spirit. That's his name. His name is Holy Spirit. He is a person. I, w I wanted to teach on this. He has... He has a personality. He has a mind, a will, and emotions. I've got all of the scriptures right here on my computer. There are 13 emblems, symbols of Holy Spirit. He thinks. Who can know the mind of Christ like Holy Spirit? He thinks. He has intellect. He has a desire. He has everything we have in our soul, our mind, will, and emotions. He has it. He's a, he's a live, living person. He's not a little fat baby cherub. He's not wind. He's like a wind. He's not a fire. He's like a fire. He's not a dove. He's like a dove. But he's, an, he's a live, living person, and he wants to communicate with you. He wants to work through you. He's the power source. He, he really is. He is the power source. 
So Holy Spirit's right by your side to help you. He's right by your side to teach you. He's shown me things that there is no way I could know. Multiple choice questions. Holy Spirit, what do I do? B. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that you can't study. You still got to study. He's going to show you things that you've forgotten. He's going to show you things Jesus said that isn't even written. Do you know all the computers in the world can't, con can, can't contain? All of Google's computers, all of Facebook's computers, all of those servers in the world can't contain the things that Jesus did. Amen. Holy Spirit's going to show you those things. He's going to show you why he took the guy outside of town and spit in his eyes. How weird that must have been. You imagine this blind guy. Well, come on, come with me. If you read that whole story, there was a reason Jesus had to get away from his disciples. There was unbelief in them. He leads them outside. The guy's blind. He can't see your thing. He hears Jesus over there going. Whoosh. You're thinking, okay, what's he doing? Next thing you know, you got, he's in the desert, right? It's, it's a wilderness area. All of a sudden, there's mud. Okay. You know, blind but not stupid. I know where that came from. Right, he's rubbing it in his eyes, and he says, "Go wash it out." And the guy's like, "Duh!" <laughs> right? He's going to show you things that make no sense to your natural intellect. He's going to teach you those things. He he is in you, alongside of you, to intercede for you. He intercedes for you. That's why it's imperative. We prayed about. We talked about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's why it's so important that you know your prayer language and you understand what is happening when you pray. See, when Holy Spirit moves on me, I pray. I talked to my brother this morning. You know, I told you, and I pray for him all the time. I'm like, Lord, I just pray that you touch my brother, God, that you bring him into the fullness of what you have for him. And after a few minutes. I've ran out of words. English can't do it anymore. So I just began, and in my mind, I'm thinking about my brother. And after just a few minutes, the burden's gone. This is what just happened. I'm down on earth praying. Holy Spirit's inside of me, giving me the words to pray. And all of a sudden, Jesus, who sits at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession he's interceding for me beside the father he nudges daddy god and says pastor gary's praying for donnie and father god says gabriel fix it and the angels come down just like jacob and bethel said i see a stairwell i see a ladder and it's going up into heaven and i see angels ascending and descending they're taking body parts down they're taking prayers up. Whatever you need is descending and ascending right there. Jesus looked at the disciples and said, yeah, you think you want to die with me, but I'll tell you what, you shall see the Son of Man with the gate open ascending. Look, there's an open heaven over you when you pray in the Spirit. Holy Spirit gives you the words. Jesus is interceding. God makes it happen. He sends angels down, and immediately Holy Spirit confirms what just happened, and that's the circle of prayer. That's what happens. It's not just repeating some blah, blah, blah tongue that you don't know what it is. It's actually God moving through you to talk to his son Jesus to pass the intercession on to Father God so he can send the answer down that you just made the petition of that you don't even know what you said. Because half the time when we pray, we're in our own intellect and we're praying our will, not God's will. When you pray in Holy Spirit, you are praying the perfect will of God. We need to pray a whole lot more in tongues and a whole lot less in our understanding. Because if you're not careful, you're doing white witchcraft or black witchcraft or just witchcraft. There ain't no color on it, right? And that's, a, that's a rebellion. That's a sin as unto witchcraft. It's the perfect prayer. And sometimes you just have to pray in tongues. Sometimes that's all you can do. And if you're limited in that, that's why, that was the call last night, that you wouldn't be limited in that. <laughs> Paracletos, we got to stop in five minutes, okay? I lost my clock watcher. Did you, are you sitting in for him, Bill? The word paracletos, okay, the same word, paracletos. This is what, this, don't turn there, but this is a scripture. First John, you can write it down. First John 2, verse 1. First John 2, verse 1. We're back on that word paracletos. It takes me like all day just to get one page of my notes done here. 
my little children, these things I write unto you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. That's the same word, an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteousness. Jesus, he, he, he says, this is your helper. This is your intercessor. Jesus is our intercessor in heaven, while Holy Spirit is our indwelling helper and intercessor here on earth. This is a good picture. You need to get this. Jesus is interceding, interceding for us at the right hand of the Father. We love to say, do you want to invite Jesus in your heart? But the truth of the matter, Jesus said, when I go away, I'm going to send someone down. Jesus went up. He sent Holy Spirit down. So Jesus really isn't in our heart. Holy Spirit is. There are the same. I wanted to talk about the, the Trinity and even the scriptures that some religions use in error saying that Jehovah God is one. That word Jehovah means plur it's a plural word in that one scripture. So it's totally an error. There, there are three. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is a triune Godhead. So Jesus goes up. Holy Spirit comes down. So now we have, a, we have an intercessor in heaven Jesus, who's interceding for us, and we have an intercessor on earth who's telling us how to intercede, to talk to our intercessor who's interceding to Father God for us. Isn't that cool? I mean, that's powerful. Jesus said this, John 14, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, comforter, that he may, he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth. That's what he calls Holy Spirit. The Spirit of truth. Look, Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. Because he is the spirit of Jesus who is the truth. Holy Spirit bears witness to the truth. Holy Spirit exposes any untruth. So if we're not in tune with Holy Spirit, we can be deceived. We can be fed a lie. Holy Spirit guides us, according to the scripture we just read, he guides us into all truth. Let me read this statement to you. If we support the sacrifice of truth for the sake of unity or the sake of love or the sake of diversity or any other reason, we deny the spirit of truth that dwells in us. And that's what's happening in the world right now. The church world and our political world and our government right now. The church that abandons truth abandons itself holy spirit will not be the comforter of those who abandon truth because he is the spirit of truth that's i know that's hard but that's that's what the word says verse 17 the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him but you know him for he dwells with you look at this and he will be in you remember he's talking to his disciples he's saying when i go away i'm gonna send another comforter right now holy spirit the spirit of truth jesus says is in me and it's dwelling with you when i go away he's going to dwell in you so this promise was fulfilled in in the resurrection when jesus came back like we talked the other night he walked through the wall and he breathed in his disciples he said receive you holy spirit he goes on to say in the same scripture, and we'll end with this, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. A little while longer and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live, because I live, you also will live. At that day you will know that I am in my Father and that you are in me. And I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who will, loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now Judas said to him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. This is really cool. He who does not love me does not keep my words and the word which you hear is not mine but the father's who sent me he goes on verse 25 these things i have spoken to you while being present with you but the helper now who's he talking about holy spirit 
whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Wow. We need to really know that. He's going to teach us all. He doesn't say he's just going to teach us spiritual things. He doesn't just say he's going to teach us a few things. He says, I'm going to teach you all things. There is no reason to be ignorant or uninformed if you have Holy Spirit. He's going to teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I said. So all of those things that weren't written in the book, Holy Spirit's going to bring them to our remembrance. Praise the Lord. Okay, I did it. Five minutes till. It's pretty good. I call that a success. <laughs> I only got three pages and we didn't get to do the whole thing on the... Actually, you know what? Let me just kind of... Uh, I'm going to give you something just to think about. Um... Uh, without trying to run over, but the, the, the doctrine of Holy Spirit, who Holy Spirit is, the, the triune Godhead, Holy Spirit being a part of it, how you talk about him, how you relate to him, how you communicate with him. So I want to leave you with this because I won't get to talk to you again for a while. Jesus may even come back. I don't know. But look, spend some time thinking about this divine person that lives inside of you if you're a born-again believer right now holy spirit leave, lives right inside of you he's not impersonal he's a divine power you it's important that we relate to him as that not an influence not a power we we need to if if we're not careful we'll start using him and calling him an it and use him as some way to exalt ourself and we'll even think, well, we have Holy Spirit and that church doesn't. That's not the way it works. That's not Christ. That's not. So he is a divine person. He, he, is, he is glory. He is the glory. And when you start realizing that, you'll start asking yourself, how can I more fully surrender to him? How can I more fully give my life to him how can holy spirit use me in a greater way you'll not you'll start you'll you'll stop you'll stop calling him the holy spirit you'll start calling him holy spirit you'll you'll get in a personal relationship with him i even though i know it's not gr grammatically correct i always call him holy spirit when i write i don't write the holy spirit i'll write holy spirit i try to make him a person like i wouldn't say the pastor deborah I would say, Pastor Deborah, I call him holy. He's my friend. He's my friend. He talks to me more than anybody. I talk to him more than anybody. People think I'm crazy because I'm talking to him. And I talk to him out loud. Faith cometh by hearing. Right? That's why you need to pray out loud. And you need to read the word out loud. Okay, so a lot of Christians go astray at that point. Uh, uh, last thing. Um, this really is the last thing. This is the greatest truth that can humble you more than anything else and put you on your face before God. So I, I encourage you to, if, you take, if you're a note taker, write this down. Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. He's the third person of the Godhead. He came to dwell in our hearts. The reason he came to dwell in our hearts is to restore us to the image of our God. And he does that as he unfolds the plan for our life. So let me, let me say it again in case you didn't get it all. Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead who has come to dwell inside of our hearts and restore us to the image of our God as God unfolds the plan for our life. That's what Holy Spirit does. He actually is the catalyst that turns us into the image of God. That's what he does. That's his job. He's, he is the entity, the person, the being, the life that puts us back where we were before Adam fell in the garden. It, it, it literally takes you back. And if you'll read in the Message Bible, you, you have that, right? If you'll read in the Message Bible, Genesis 2, don't read it right now, but just remember that. Read, or, or, I'm sorry, Genesis 1, I think Genesis 1, 2. It talks about Holy, what Holy Spirit was doing prior to that. He was hovering. 
He was hovering. You know, right now, Holy Spirit's hovering over somebody in this room wanting to come alive in them and to be that catalyst and to be that change. He is the agent of change. Thank <laughs> you.